the Variety Artist, episode 23. This one's all about, well, lots of stuff. We talk about a career in juggling, how to make a viral video, how to create a booming arts economy, and more. And on Mike's show notes page, there's a picture of the Odd Fellows building and David Letterman on the Coke bike. You'll know exactly what we're talking about after you listen to this episode. If you haven't already, make sure to join my Facebook group at The Variety Artist on Facebook and look for pics of my upcoming interviews. You can ask me to ask questions of our guests. When you ask a question, I'll give you a shout out on the podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. They're offering you, The Variety Artist, a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at thevarietyartist.com slash book. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Just go to thevarietyartist.com slash book right after this podcast and get your free audiobook. Now, let's start the show. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. He's the artistic director for Johnson Hall and an advocate for the arts in the state of Maine. He's a comedian, TV host, filmmaker, variety artist, and much, much more. As a comedian, Mike has performed everywhere from the Kennedy Center to the White House and from Italy to India. The Portland Phoenix called him a comedic genius. Variety Arts, I give you Mike Micklon. All right. <laughs> How's it going, Mike? It's going well. How are you? Good, good, good. For, for people who haven't seen you before, uh, performing-wise, what is it that you do? Well, gosh, so many things. But in my in my variety show, in my I, w- I would call my my forty five minute set, I am a comedic juggler. I do a lot of characters juggling. Uh, I always say really, really, really bad magic, and a lot of audience participation and improvisation. And is mainly live theater, TV. What is it? Ninety ninety nine percent live theater. That's that's predominantly what I do. What type of venues do you work? So I do mostly theaters now. Uh, I finally, for myself, kind of, <laughs> I I uh, moved on up a little bit. So now I'm a little bit more, uh, a little bit more picky, and I really try to do mostly theaters. I have one uh, sort of stock show that I've been doing now, and I th- I started when I was 19, and I just turned 51, and I've been performing at a place called. <laughs> Camp Sunshine in Casco, Maine, uh, and it is a camp for uh, children with terminal illnesses. So the whole family comes, and I am the kickoff entertainment about five or six times per summer. That's the one show I've been like, I'm going to do that one until they stop asking me. So So you do a performance uh, a number of times a year for, are they kids that are terminally ill? It is. It's it's the whole family comes, um, but it's for it's a specific camp for families that have a child that has terminal illness, and they may be they could be in any stage of it. So they could either be at the very beginning, they've just found out, they've been dealing with it for a while, or they're in recovery, and they come every year, and it's fully free for them. It's an amazing place in in Casco, Maine. It's beautiful. Do you do some sort of a a meet and greet afterwards, so they get to meet you and you get to meet them? I do a little bit. I mean, it's sort of it's sort of informally done like that. But I I've been like I said, I've been doing it for so long that that'll be people. I, I actually I'm not kidding you. I had a woman come up to me. <laughs> and she actually sent me the photograph, and maybe I can get it to you. Uh, <laughs> and she actually photoshopped it for me. But I had picked her in 1989 to be my assistant and then here it was two years ago i picked her daughter for the exact same routine (laughs) (laughs) and she sent me a photograph in the exact same position it was hilarious i couldn't believe it but she uh she she sent it off to me it was pretty cool and do you have a lot of volunteers on stage do you have a are a lot of folks in wheelchairs and such there, there is, uh, but but a lot of times it's not that obvious. So so uh, it, you know they could just be losing their hair, or they could be totally fine. Or I pick a sibling, and it's different every time. But for the most part, they're in pretty. You know, they're pretty able to get around. And I just always feel good because I go, man, for forty five minutes, I'm making that whole family laugh and have a great time. And and that's why it's the one play, one campground that I still do after all these years, and I've just never stopped. <laughs> that has got to be rewarding. 
it, it is. It really is. It's it's a it's a special place, and it's it's one of those ones where I go. We do every, everyone that performs there does it for less than half price of what they would normally do, and it's one of those ones where you feel as a performer you feel so good just knowing that you're you're helping make make maybe make them smile a little bit for an hour. You know. Now let's switch gears a little bit. Tell me about your early evening show. Sure. So I I opened my own theater. Uh, in the big city of Buckfield, Maine, in 1998, and I ran that for 14 years. I I had been a, a, a strictly a variety performer. Had you know, I did my runouts. That was my gig, and I'd started doing more and more theaters. And and I knew that I, I had an idea of how I wanted my shows to be run, because sometimes you know you go to a space and they don't always know how to treat a performer. They don't always know how to treat an audience. And I wanted to bring, I wanted to make one place where I knew I could treat the artist really well and treat the audience really well and try to see if we got some magic and boy, we did. And so when I was putting together my first week of shows, when I knew when we were going to open, uh, we opened May of 98. I said, geez, I got to fill out that week. And I said, you know, I've always wanted to do my own late night talk show. I think I will. So I created and, and where it was going to be at seven o'clock at night. I was like, well, it's not a late night show. It's an early evening show. So we called it the early evening show. And I had a co-host, a band, a desk. We did variety acts, uh, a lot like you'd see old Tonight Show. That's really, really what it's fashioned after. Uh-huh. And so I did monologues, did the whole thing. And I'm telling you, I did did it just to fill out that week and it was the first show that sold out and then it sold out nearly every single show for two straight years we did it every month then we started adding a friday night uh, and we sold out all of those i ran that right straight through till 2012 closed my theater thought i was done with that and I, but I've been hired at a bunch of other theaters and now I do it the first Saturday of every month at the Celebration Barn Theater in South Paris, Maine. And we sell out every show there. <laughs> uh, and I can honestly say that show, like everything that I'd ever learned in theater, I, I put it to use in that show because it's, it's scripted to a degree, but not n- never scripted. You know, it's like, I know what my monologue is going to be. We have a, a show order, but the rest of it is really, it's, it's left up to my improv skills and, and my team's improv skills. And man, we, no matter how hard we try, they're two and a half hours, no matter what we do. And, and nobody's <laughs> complaining. We're still selling them out. So nobody's complaining. <laughs> I'll be, you have some crazy stories from then, huh? You know, it's funny because I've been through, God, I used to have a co-host. I don't have a co-host anymore, but I, I've gone, I went through like four different co-hosts and they were all great. Uh, and just for whatever reasons, they had to go on to other things or, you know, whatever. And then eventually I went on and just did it myself. But the team I've had, my band is exemplary. The, my co-host, it, for real, it's, he's not, he doesn't sit out there with me, but it's, it's a guy named Fritz Groba. Fritz is uh, a Maine alum. He's a five-time gold medal winner with the International Jugglers Championship. He mm. set a few records, and he's also one of the main guys in EP Bird, the Diet Coke and Mentos guys. We're going to talk a lot more about that. I have sure. that in my notes here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and Fritz Fritz has been my writing partner for ten or more years, and and I tell you what, I I've never had a better writing partner ever. We it's we we have such a standard when we write because if if we make each other laugh, <laughs> we know it's going to make the audience laugh and we and it has to be you know it's funny we we don't just go oh that made me laugh it didn't make you laugh we'll use it it's like we've really got to make sure that what we're writing is is uh, is getting both of us and it, and it works it works really well do you have any off the cuff do you have any funny stories from the early evening show I do. One of my favorite ones, we had this um, group called Foreshadow. They were a group from Minnesota uh, and they were an acapella group and they were phenomenal. They were just, they were just the greatest guys, four guys. They came up to do the early evening show. It was in the summertime and it was a little warm in the theater. So we left the back door open. One of the guys, Kevin in the group said, you know, Hey, I know you're leaving the door open here. We are in Buckfield, Maine. He's like, are you, is there no chance like a bear's going to walk in or anything? And you're like, <laughs> no, no bear's going to walk in. Well, I had a golden retriever dog named Bear oh. <laughs> who was upstairs and someone had gone upstairs and left the door open. And so Bear just kind of wandered down. And so he rounds the corner in the backstage and somebody in the audience sees him and knows who my dog is. And as Kevin's turning around, seeing this big brown creature somebody <laughs> says bear and i'm telling you i i'm not kidding i've never seen this happen he 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 literally jumped so high 
that he fell down when he when he landed. He oh. he he was so freaked out and he was crawling backwards and it was just my dog standing there who then promptly peed because he was so frightened by what just <laughs> happened. So it was Wait. it was and that was and that was like man that is that is like that, that was is, live during the show. That was live during the show, and man, the laughter! Uh, it was it was hard to get that to stop. It really, it really was. That's one of those two and a half hour shows that goes three exactly. Hours. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because people were just, we just couldn't get it back either. It took a long time, and then they still had to sing. But it was the, and then I had to tell that story. I was like, he was just saying, you know, is a bear gonna walk in? But it was like the <laughs> best timing ever. So you imagine just out of the corner of his eyes, sees this four legged brown creature as someone saying bear. That's great. It was That's awesome. great. Awesome. <laughs> do you have another one for us? I do. So, yeah. So we, you know, we did uh, on our 13th early evening show. It was, it was our 13th sold out show. So this is early on. This is like, you know, 99. We are like, Oh, it wouldn't it be funny. We'll, we'll make it be like, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's unlucky 13. So we set up all these different things. So I had a light, I made a fake light out of a coffee can. It looked like a little Fresnel that mm-hmm. hung directly above me that we padded the hell out of it, but we put a, a gel frame on it and the whole thing. And we practiced it 10 times that when I say, you know, it's lucky 13, somebody backstage would pull a string, it would pull a pin and this thing would look, it would look like a Fresnel came down and cracked me on the head. Okay. So we'd, we'd set that one up. Then we had, we'd taken my desk and uh, it had cloth around the side of it. So we took off one of the legs and I put just a, basically a yardstick there. And I was like, oh, what I'll do is I'll come over, I'll sit on the edge and then the stage will, the desk will break. Yeah. So we had these two things lined up and there was a third one too and it'll come to me. But the best part was, is I do the joke and I go, you know, it's lucky 13, but I'm not worried. They pull the pin, <laughs> the, the, the light falls and the corner of the gel frame hits me square in the center of my head and I'm telling you, I, it, I, I saw stars and it, and it really cracked me in the head. And I'm supposed to fall on the stage and like pretend to pass out. And I'm just laying there writhing in pain going. And I'm pretty sure I'm bleeding at that point, but I'm like, I'm okay. <laughs> then I get up and the whole idea is I get up and I'm supposed to stumble over and I sit on the sta- on the on the, the desk, which is supposed to break, which it does. But I had not practiced this. And the corner of my desk, it was a square top. The corner of the desk, when it broke, it drove the corner right into the back of my calf with all of my weight on it. And I tore my, I tore my pants and literally did start to bleed on the back. So I, I'm bleeding on my head. I'm bleeding oh. on the back of my, and we just got to keep rolling. Right. And we're, we're, the audience is dying. Cause they're going, man, that stuff looks so real. The audience and, is laughing. They're having a great and time and you're and dying. It, yeah. <laughs> and it was all real. And I'm, and I'm seriously, I'm bleed. I go backstage. Like one, once I, or once I got the first guest on stage to do something, I slipped backstage and I'm like, I am bleeding like crazy. And I need a new pair of pants. Oh. It, was, and it was, and there was another thing. I can't remember what the third one was, but we had a third similar setup gag that was that everything went everything actually ha- I actually got hurt by every single thing, <laughs> and we were supposed to be faking it, but it was that that's that's sort of that show in a nutshell. <laughs> it's like you know, that's perfect. Bears on stage, and you know, but it, but that's the that's the art of of the live theater. That's why I love it so much because you can practice, you can prepare, you can do everything you want and then reality is going to happen. And then how you deal with it is really is how well you can take care of the audience. Cause I could have just crawled off stage and gone, I'm going to bed. Yeah. <laughs> but you went on, but I went on and I bled and I, I fixed everything. And, and, and the best part was we could just, keep playing it up because I really, the back of my leg, I am serious. I had from above my knee all the way down to almost my ankle. I had this gas, this red, you know, it was either really swollen or it actually, I'd broken the skin on it. And I saw so I'm, I, I was in pain and the whole show I'm limping and they're dying. They're like, Oh, he's sticking with it. And I'm like, yeah, well, <laughs> he's sticking with it. <laughs> Cause I'm going to go to the emergency room and then this is over. <laughs> he's bleeding for his art. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yes, that was yes, and yeah, and there's many. There's been many a show at my theater where where we've ended up. We we used to have an award. We at at the end of a run of shows, we'd always do um, because I had the, it was the Odd Fellow Theater. We uh, we do a, a, an award show called the Oddies, mm-hmm. and we would come up with these crazy crazy categories based on what happened. And and it was always most injured was always on the was always <laughs> that was one of the most coveted awards because uh, there was always somebody that was like you know yeah you got hit like four times during the show or. <laughs> We do it. We, we survive. That first year, you're like, I'm winning this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm totally. Oh, yes. I'm totally winning that. 
So that but that particular show, but the early evening show I do and the theater uh, that I run, which is Johnson Hall in Gardner, um, I, that's all the stuff I'm pushing. And I have a film company called Boo Dog Films that I that I do. Oh, yeah. You know, let's go ahead and talk about Boo Dog Films. Sure, sure. What do you do? Uh, that is your company? That is my company. Uh, I started that in 2008. I was doing short videos just for fun. I, I had started working with EP Birds, the, the Diet Coke and Mentos guys had shot their videos. And then I started making some short videos of my own. And then eventually actually went whole hog after I closed the theater, made a full length feature film, a comedy of Richard III called Richard Cubed. And you can, if you go to Boo Dog Films, you can see the trailers on there. It's finally after, we, we debuted it in 2014. And this October, I will finally have the DVDs. Oh, it's, nice. it's, it's amazing what a long, process it is one of my film mentors and performance mentors is a guy named Leland Faulkner and when I told him I was going to do this project and he was like okay have you have you allotted enough time and I was like yeah I think I can get this all done in a year and he just laughed <laughs> and I he's he's very right you know it took me a year of pre-production it took we it took a year to shoot everything but we actually only shot it in 23 days over a year oh and then I edited it <laughs> for for a year, uh, mm -hmm. then debuted it, then re-edited it, then color corrected it, and sound engineering and all this stuff. But all this stuff, I'd raised enough money to make the film. I never raised <laughs> enough money to finish the film. <laughs> so it is finally going to be on DVD in October. So, And how can somebody get a hold of one of those? They'll, if they go to Boo Dog Films, eventually we'll have a link right on there to be able to purchase the, the DVD if they like. And plus, if they go to Boo Dog Films' uh, Facebook page, they could, they'll, it'll be a link on there as well. Now, you mentioned a couple of times EP Bird Studios. Sure, yeah. Uh, and they do viral videos. I looked up and they, they've done all the big viral wow. videos over the past 10 or 15 years, right? Yeah, it's uh, and and I've luckily been able to be a part of most of them, so it's been fun. We so when we were doing the early evening show, Fritz uh, had a friend that we have a mutual friend, but he was pretty close with Fritz. He'd taken some performance workshops with him, a guy named Stephen Volts from Massachusetts, and he would come up every single month just to see the early evening show and oh. just loved it. Then they, you know, he would stay at Fritz's when whenever he came up, and one of the times he was up, he was he said to Fritz, he said, "Have you seen this video? These videos online?" If if you drop a Mentos candy into a bottle of soda, it explodes. Yeah. And, and Fritz said no. And they, they looked at it and then they, they decided they were like, man, we could do something fun with that. So they spent about three or four months tinkering on it and they made a, a 10 bottle experiment that we videotaped and we made it look as like, as if we, they'd gone out back of my theater and we were doing it live. I would talk to them, but it was really just a video, but we showed this 10 bottle video and the crowd went, absolutely nuts for it just thought it was the funniest thing huh. so then then they were like wow we got something here so then they hunkered down and they spent a year plotted this whole thing out practiced learned learned everything that like oh bottles it won't erupt if if the bottles are cold <laughs> you know oh. they have to be 98 degrees or uh, to get the best effect and they learned about how to make sure uh, it was crazy so in um june i want well actually i want to say probably in it must have been may of 2006, we shot the, their first big video, just a one camera shoot. I think there was one edit in it, just one little tiny little bobble that they, they took out. And then we, we showed it on the June early evening show and had posted it that morning. Uh, and by the end of the night, they had already had over a hundred thousand views in, in that in, by the end of the early evening show, they'd already had a hundred thousand views. Wow. And we were like, and we didn't know, we didn't never heard the term viral video at that point. This was 2006. And next thing I know, you know, it's now been, I want to say that that first video has been seen so over, over 150 million times. Now. Oh yeah. I mean, I've they, seen it and I, yeah, they got nominated for a daytime Emmy. Oh. Which we which we went. My <laughs> wife and I got to go with them because I was the cameraman. So we went. They it was great. I mean, it was uh, SpongeBob SquarePants was the host, the guy who does the voice. Uh -huh. uh, but we got beat out by the Office. The Office had done a series of viral videos uh, of, uh, called The Accountants. Oh, the, they, the the TV show The Office. Yep. But what's funny is is when you start off, there were three thousand people in the room. And by the end of the night, as people win or lose or whatever, the room just gets less and less people. So by the end of the night, we were the third from the end category. Oh. I walked, I was, I was like four <laughs> feet away from all of the people in the office and taking photographs because there was nobody else in the room. It was hilarious. But yeah, <laughs> that's, so we, great. That, that's our big claim to fame. <laughs> that is a claim to fame. Now tell me about, because I've seen this too, the extreme sticky note one. 
Yeah, so that one was really fun because we got so they once they once they had gotten some fame with that and Coke had really come around. And originally Coke was like they didn't want us they didn't want to be connected to us mm-hmm. because they were like we prefer people drink our product and then somebody smartly in the marketing company said are you out of your mind people are loving this video and you know what it's sugar water man like if people are drinking it or playing with it let's be glad they're excited about it so then they came they came around and became a real big sponsor of theirs and then they said we want to push some other videos that maybe don't even have our product in it it's fine if they don't so we started working with sticky notes and the the ones that that are connected in sort of like a slinky type fashion yeah and we spent months and months and months playing with that and then we got flown out to Los Angeles to the CBS lot and we actually shot this video in one of their office sets. We had a couple of actors, of course I don't know who they are. They were there was a TV show called Samurai Girl on at the time and it was the two two leading the actor and actress from that. They were actually in the video. Uh, we had a real <laughs> we had a real production crew. They allowed me to press record because up until that point I had recorded every video that we had ever done. Ah. So, so I wasn't my camera gear, but they let me press record on the thing. So it was kind of fun. But I got to be there to help build stuff and to to help coordinate the and produce the. the so your job in pre production, they're like they're like, okay, here's a million sticky notes. Play yes. with them and and have fun and and try to figure it out. Exactly, and we you know we figured out all these waterfalls, and then the the craziest thing that we learned. And I must say, they, the Fritz and Steven, really, they, you know, these are the guys, they'll stay up till four in the morning tinkering on this stuff. And I'll come in and go, how do you want to shoot it? <laughs> you know, but they go, <laughs> they learned that different colors of oh. sticky notes flow different. They, some flow faster than others. And it's consistent. Purple flows faster than they might be because there's probably more ink or whatever it is, but purple flows faster than yellow. Yellow flows faster than green. So they had to learn all these different techniques to get all this stuff to go together. And it was, it was wild. It's been, <laughs> it's so we, 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 we created a, a Coke and Mentos rocket car that we took on David Letterman. Mm-hmm. And that one was, that was one of the most fun for me because we got to go to New York. I drove a U-Haul with it in there and we, we got to Dave, actually drove the rocket car that's on one of that was on one of his highlight reels for a while so it was pretty crazy <laughs> who thought of the rocket chair uh fritz fritz and steven they were like they right from the beginning they were like there's so much power behind this they were like we we have to be able to do propulsion so we started off like just seeing if we we, we created little mini ones with the bot we'd strap the bottle to skateboards and mm. set it up against a wall with without anything and just see how far it would go and then we realized if we put a tube on it with a with a dowel in it that it'll actually force the dowel out which actually gives it five times the speed oh. so we eventually made these really long things that had um lucite poles inside pvc and all attached to these Coke bottles. And it was like, I think it was a hundred Coke bottles in the first rocket car. And we modified a trailer, uh, basically a tow behind trailer. We welded a, a bike front on the front of it. It was insane. <laughs> it was insane. <laughs> I'd be scared to get in that thing. Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny cause there's no, I mean, it just, it's just a big push. That's all it is. So it, once it goes, then it, then it's really, as soon as that first liftoff, it just, it's just slowing down after that, but it's pretty funny. Okay. <laughs> How'd you hook up with, with Weezer and do their pork and beans video? They, again, they, they saw these guys, they saw uh, Fritz and Steven's video, you know, and again, a lot of people, cause you know, uh, what is it? Okay. Go. Okay. Go is sort of one of those interesting bands that you don't know. Are they more of an internet sensation or are they more of a band? Right. So that's they, the band that has all the, the, um, oh yeah. All the crazy, like like a, a bowling ball hits a, yeah. hits yes, a stick exactly. that knocks over yep. a balloon that, Exactly. And all their videos are super viral and, and great. So a lot of other bands were going, we got to get some of this. We want, because obviously, obviously I'm starting when they were starting to understand social media going, the better our videos are, the more people are going to see it. And Oh, by the way, they'll listen to our music and maybe buy it. Yeah. So they got some internet stars to, to be in that video and, and Fritz and Steven got to do that. It was great. Well, now we're going to switch to Johnson hall. Sure. You are the artistic director uh, for Johnson hall, right? I am. I'm actually the executive artistic director. Ah, That's fancy! I get a. Well, I get a slash. What exact? What exactly is Johnson Hall? So Johnson Hall is the oldest operating opera house in the state of Maine, mm. and it was built in 1864. And my connection to it, it's funny because it's uh, it's in a town called Gardner, Maine, which is about an hour from my house. 
to give you a little bit of a history is so Tony Montanero, which you may have heard of, Tony was this amazing protege of Marcel Marceau, comes to Maine in the 70s. Somebody shows him this old barn. He buys this old barn, creates the Celebration Barn Theater, and then starts to invite people from all over the country to come study with him, help him build the barn. Two of those people were Benny and Denise Real. They were from upstate New York. And then they created a show called the Buckfield Leather and Lather Traveling Variety Show. And it was a real, true, old medicine style show. They had a 1928 Rio Speedwagon truck. And they, they would drive it up onto a trailer. They would take it to shows. They would tee it up so that the back of the truck was actually the backstage. They had a big canopy that came out. And then they would do old-style vaudeville shows. And then they would sell leather products. They would make vests and hats and gloves and all kinds of – and they actually made them. Uh -huh. uh, and, and so they would oftentimes do the shows for free and then sell the stuff. So I grew up watching these guys right in my town going, like, these guys are the greatest thing ever. I eventually – took a drama class uh, with them and uh, with Denise. And so I became an apprentice of theirs. I apprenticed with them from 1982 to probably 1990. And in the middle there, they moved to Gardner because Benny was traveling, doing shows, and somebody showed him this old building. Him and his wife, they, they packed up, they sold the, the vaudeville truck, and they moved to Gardner and purchased this building. The, the theater basically opened in 89 here. And what they did is they renovated the first floor, which is about a 117 seat theater, which is what I'm running right now. And then we are in a capital campaign to renovate the upstairs, which will be a 400 seat theater, which is the actual old opera house. It's funny, I, I grew up watching Benny and Denise work here and I helped do stuff here. Performers came and we did fundraisers and they got the first floor done, but it's, you know, it's 30 years later and the third floor still isn't renovated. I came in in 2013. We are now $3 million into a capital campaign. Mm -hmm. We have totally revamped what we do downstairs. They used to do about 12 shows a year. This year we'll do 49. Oh, we're seeing about 3,000 people a year through the doors, people coming from all over the state. It's crazy. I, I took all that I learned at the Oddfellow Theater and brought it here, but I really did it because I want to see Betty and Denise's theater get done. How are you raising that money? So every, every possible way imaginable. We found, you know, we have a, a, a great bank up here that was the first one in, and they basically, they were in with the first million, uh, essentially. They said, you know, they believed in what we're doing. They saw the changes that we were making and really becoming an actual active um, theater in the community and, and really seeing the changes that we were making. So they said, we're in. And part of what they do is we have, this is technical boring stuff I've learned, but I know more about it now than I ever wanted to, is uh, federal and state historic tax credits. So because this is a historic building, we are eligible for, it's $1.7 million in tax credits. And basically, if you do a historic renovation in accordance with the national standards, you get what they, they give you tax credits, but if you're, because we're a nonprofit, we don't need them, we are allowed to sell them. And that was one of the first things the bank did is they stepped up and they bought all the federal ones, which was almost 800,000, and then they threw in the rest uh, to bring it up to a million. So you're selling tax credits? Yeah, and it's all legal. <laughs> it's, oh, that's it's, great. It's, it's amazing. It's how it's done. You may think that that's all technical and boring. I think that's yeah. fascinating. It's, a, it's an amazing process. It, it's funny because it's like anything, right? It's like whether you're trying to get shows or you're trying to get donors or you're trying to get yeah. anybody to participate in anything. You have to be passionate about your story. That's right. And you have to be able to, to, to articulate that and get people excited about it. Well, bringing in a big theater like that into a community, I would think it helps everybody in the community, businesses. Absolutely. It does. People. I mean, there's a, um, the National Endowment did a, a study and they call it the economic calculator and you can look it up. It has a way of calculating. You go, how many people in your community? What is your average ticket price going to be? What's the number of seats? And they run it through this whole calculator and then you put in like number what you expect your number of shows to be and they tell you what you can expect people to spend in the community outside of your tickets and we're at nearly half a million a year that people will just be spending on gas restaurants hotels convenience store items and then shops and they they, they go statistically it's that's that's the way it, it works I think that's fascinating. I always wonder about that because someone will bring in the example is always the big football team into a city and, and it brings all sorts of commerce. And I wondered how they calculated all that. Yeah. Well, so 
I grew up in Buckfield. Uh, there's, it's a town of under 2,000 people, tiny little town. The Maine Arts Commission used to have a program called the Maine Touring Arts Program. And basically what it was is they would jury visual artists, musicians, jugglers, mimes, comedians, actors. You would get on their touring roster in the state, and then any nonprofit, and including schools, could put in and get up to 50% and sometimes 75% of the artist fee. So what it created was for, for performing artists, it was the boom of the, you know, of the seventies and eighties because it, it, everybody could get funding for them. So you could charge, you know, 500 bucks where back then schools didn't have it, but they may only have to pay 250 or, or 150 to get you to come in. So it just, it, it exploded performing arts. So even in my little town of Buckfield, I was seeing monthly, and I'm talking K to 12, uh, we had performers coming in all the time. So when I came to Gardner, we had about 1,700 people come to the theater that year. And I did all the statistics on it. And I was like, wow, there was seven kids for the entire year, <laughs> seven, seven out of 1700. So, and I was like, man, we are missing a mark. And when I was in Buckfield, man, every show we had babies all the way up to grannies at every show we had a, we had a cross section all the time. And I was just like, I didn't know why, but I realize now is that there, there was this long tradition in Buckfield for artists coming in and people just knew it, but here it just, it hadn't happened. So I said, man, I got to do something. So I created this program called the artists in the schools program where I was like, I'm going to go get funding. I know they're going to want to give me funding because if I'm doing something for the kids, I'm doing something for the schools, it's going to resonate with a lot of funders. And boy, I got to tell you, it did. I mean, it has been one of the number one sources. We just got money from the Newman's Own Foundation. We got money from the Stephen Tabitha King Foundation, places where we've never been able to get money from before. But right now, it's only in our school district up here, but that's, it's yep. like eight schools. And we're working this year will be the first year that we kind of go outside of those borders. But we put in probably 20 shows a year for free into the schools. And what's great is, is that a lot of times it's shows that I'm already having here at Johnson Hall. So the week of their show, I bring them into the schools and then we create all mm -hmm. these fans who then go, I want to go see it at Johnson Hall. So this is no lie. So first year, seven kids, second year, 200. And now we're probably right around in the four to 500 range annually of kids under the age of 17. So which for us is a major, that's a major piece of the pie. I mean, and also our demographic was, was really the 45 and up crowd for all of the shows. Now we're getting the kids and then we're getting their tw late 20s, 30 year old parents coming in. The Artists in Schools program is one of the things I'm most proud of here because now when I go to schools, like seriously, nobody knew who we were. <laughs> but now when I go to the school, I think they think my name is Johnson Hall and I'm okay with that. But I go sure. in and the kids will be like, oh, Johnson Hall, it's Johnson Hall. Hey, it's Mr. <laughs> Hall, Mr. Hall. It's Mr. Hall, right? Exactly. And <laughs> it's really become this thing. And then we offer, we have a theater program called Spark, which is actually going on right now. Oh. And we do six weeks of that. And it's sort of like there's two weeks of beginner, two weeks of what we call creation lab, where they learn how to create a show. And then the last two weeks is advanced where it's all it's really advanced theater techniques because we we have this philosophy that just because they're kids doesn't mean they can't learn the real stuff True. you know i feel i feel like a lot of summer theater camp things are, are basically daycare with a theatrical theme and what we chose to do is go let's let's make this be a real that these are real techniques that their drama coaches are going to be like Wow, where did you learn that? They learn about improv and they learn about uh, how to present and how to be vocal and how to project and, and how to enter the stage and exit the stage and, and stay connected to an audience and not drop character. And it's really fun. Uh, that's something close to my heart because I'm, I'm a school assembly entertainer. That's what I do. Night. Exactly. I love doing that. So in your case, everybody wins. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the community wins, the theater right. wins, the schools win, the teachers yep. win, everybody, yep. the, the entertainers win. Like I had a principal, the best story, my favorite story, there's always that one, but she said this little boy who, you know, she says nowadays it's tough because these kids come in and they've got parents that are addicted to opioids and they've got violence in the home. They've got all these things. And there was this one little boy that sort of had a checkbox in every negative category you can imagine. But he came to a show here and he got 
picked to go up on stage. After the show, he, he went up and he, and he hugged her and he said, this was the greatest day of my life. And she said he went and in his art class, he drew pictures of the show. He Aww. asked to go to the library to find a book on magic. And they were like, none of these things were his normal, his normal mode. Because I believe that's what the arts do, right? Because they give us another option and you start to realize, oh, I, it's not about me becoming a doctor. I can start working on this right now. I can start working on a craft at, at 10. We're going to move on to uh, a little game that we like ah. to play called Fact or Something John Just Made Up. Does that sound That's, like fun? It sounds like a lot of fun. Is it fact? Ooh. Or is it something John just made up? Ah. Okay, so here's how it works. I'm going to give you a headline and you tell me whether it's fact, something that may have happened to you or something maybe you did right. and tell me a little more about it or if it's fiction, something I just made up. Okay. Here we go. I'm ready. Uh, first headline, Mike's first juggling partner was Patrick Dempsey. Ah, Dr. McDreamy. That is true. <laughs> oh, yep. Patrick Dempsey actually went to Buckfield High School. When I was telling you that I took that drama class, I actually took that drama class. Pat Dempsey was also taking drama for the first time with Denise oh. Friel. Uh, and they, they, took, they also took Pat under their wing, taught him how to juggle. Pat went on to, I think he placed second in the IJA Juniors in like 82 or 83. Is that right? It, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's actually a great juggler. Unicycle, all that stuff. And I did my first shows ever with him uh, we had a duet show called the gentleman it was funny i was just at a, a, an event the other night and i met the woman who hired us and it was it was in 1983 hmm. uh, at this place called the buffy quimby hall <laughs> i couldn't even juggle at the time I, I was so new in this i hadn't even quite i well i could juggle but i i, I wasn't it wasn't performable yet so i did verbal <laughs> comedy and it was bizarre. <laughs> but we, yep, we, that was, that was it. Pat, I, I, I get to see him once in a while and we still, he, he still remembers me. <laughs> oh, he's like, Hey Mike. Hey, 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 I know that guy. Yeah. What's going on? Exactly. <laughs> All right. We're going to go to our second headline. Are you ready? I'm ready. Here we go. Uh, Mike's second juggling partner was Patrick Swayze. <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> oh no it's not true no he was my first dance partner no i'm kidding oh no 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 <laughs> no no i never met patrick swayze <laughs> mike cut off his left pinky finger juggling chainsaws ah that sounds so true but it's not true. <laughs> oh, okay. But I do have a great, I did, I did stab myself in my palm and I still have a nice scar from it right before I went on stage. And how did, and how did you do that? I was, I was at a show and I was just backstage dubbing around. And the first thing I was going to go out and do is juggle knives. And I have this whole joke that I would do. And, and so I was backstage just warming up just as I threw up, you know, I was juggling them and I threw one up to do a catch at the end through a double. Someone <laughs> said, Hey, you ready to go on? And I was like, yep. And I just misjudged and no. it stabbed me right in the palm. I still have the scar to show it. And actually it hit hard enough that when I turned my hand over, the knife didn't immediately fall out. <gasps> so it was deep. Uh, and so I was bleeding like you, and I have to, I, and that show back then was almost predominantly all juggling. So, so uh, <laughs> yeah, so I didn't lose a pinky, but I, I bled like a stuck pig. This bleeding on stage thing seems to be a common theme. Huh? It is. Yes. I'm very good at it. It's one of my, <laughs> it's one of the, you know, all right, last one. Yep. Mike married his wife twice. Ah, yes, this is true. Oh, my, true. How did that happen? That my wife and I, we got married in 1988. I was 20. I wasn't even legal to drink at my wedding. My wife was 21. She could. We were married and then briefly briefly a 10 month divorce in, <laughs> in 2010 and then immediately remarried in 2011. It's kind of interesting because this year for, for, for 1988, this is our 30th anniversary of our first marriage, which is, which is a <laughs> pearl. And it's also our seventh anniversary, which is wool. 
So when people ask what we got her, I said, I, I knit one and I pearl two. That was the only thing I could do. <laughs> So do you celebrate two anniversaries? We don't. We we chose not to celebrate the first one anymore. We were like, we, you know, it was funny because I was a guy, I was on the road a lot in the early days when my babies were babies. Hopefully this is good enough for the, for the podcast, but I, I, I did my first overseas gig. I did uh, two weeks in Germany and Italy mm-hmm. and my wife was home with a four-year-old, a two-year-old and a brand new baby. Uh, all three of my boys. And when I got back, she had scheduled my vasectomy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> she said, if this is the life we're going to live, you, we are done having children. Um, so, so basically, so then when I built the theater, it was like, okay, I'm gone all the time. I got to be home more. But then we lived above the theater. I was home, but I was still gone all the time. So we, over time, you know, just was just like, she just always felt like I'm working with the kids. I'm doing all this stuff. You're always doing all these dreams, all these things. And we eventually decided, well, let's part ways. And then uh, I realized that that was the dumbest thing I'd ever done in my entire life was to Mm. let her go. And then I I had to win her back because she was like, is it going to be different? And I'm happy to say seven years in, it's uh, it's great. We, we often talk about our, our first wives and husbands and, We'd say we've we've got much better, much better spouses now. So that was fact or something John just made up. Ah. Now, do you have a horror story for us? A performing horror story for us, Mike? I do. So I'm trying to think because I've I've kind of told you all the ones. I mean, well, I have another bleeding one. I'll tell the quick Uh, one. So yeah, other than. Other than the thing bonking you in the head, stabbing you in the calf, stabbing you in the hand. Exactly. So, well, this one's another head one, but I used to have a routine that I did that I wrote this slapstick routine called Late for the Recital about a guy who's late to play his violin at a recital. And it was this really fun slapstick thing with a violin case and music stand and had a lot of fun with it. It's It's really the act that got me, got me to the Kennedy Center, got me to a number of places. People were like, that's great. Mm -hmm. But it was really good and it was always it was a great way to close a show and i got i got hired to do this campground and they were like they had this little indoor pavilion but they were like you know what? it's so beautiful out today why don't we we want to do it down we want to bring chairs down and have everybody sit down by the water can you do this show on the beach and i was like uh, oh god no and they were like mm-hmm. you know what we'll do we'll get a piece of plywood we'll get a four by eight sheet of plywood put it on the ground you can do your show on that right and i'm like yeah, okay yeah. sure so run through the whole show and it and I survive. I do everything okay. And I get to the end and I'm gonna do I'm gonna do late. So I hit the music, I do it. And I'm sweating. Like it is when she says on the beach, she is talking about it is a ninety plus degree day on the uh, beach. So uh, I am like I am sweating like I have never like it's getting into my you know it's it's just you know the salt is getting into your eyes. It was miserable, but I'm just sweating like a dog. So I'm going to close with late. I go to do it and I, I use a metal folding chair and there's a point, you know, this, di- and, and the great part about slapstick, right? Is they don't know if you're really hurt unless you do it the way I did it that day. I go, there's this point where I'm supposed to grab the, the stand and I, it's stuck. And then I pull up on it. And the move is I put my thumb over the end and I do a, I do a head, a forehead bang. But just as I did that, the corner of my chair slid off that four by eight sheet of plywood right into the sand. And I launched backwards. It didn't get my thumb on, but still drove this pipe <laughs> straight into my forehead. And Ow. I did not know that I had cut a moon shaped slash in my forehead. So what, oh. what I think is just a lot of sweat is an ungodly <laughs> amount of blood dripping down my face. So when I got done, it was just like always just an enormous wave of applause, sometimes standing O's if I could get them. Not this time. People were, I mean, the clapping was like this slow, <laughs> concerned. I mean, it was the weirdest thing. I was like, whoa, I just bombed, but I don't know how. And I had the the promoter came up and they was like, you are bleeding. Like you can't believe. And I looked down and my, oh my shirt, gosh. you know, cause I'm moving a hundred miles an hour. Or I don't have time to, to notice. And I was yeah. just, I was, bl- I was just bloodied, but that was the one where it was just like, yeah, didn't matter how good I'd done the rest of the show that people were just like, that is the worst thing I've ever seen. Oh, well, I'm glad you told me that story. Cause you know, we're sticking with the theme now. Yes. Yes. It's blood. It's all blood. <laughs> I don't bleed as much anymore. It's pretty good. <laughs> Now, you, you see, because you're in a, a theater that just stays there, you're not traveling exactly. around. I'm not running around as much. Right, exactly. Right, right. 
All right, now give us one piece of advice for the beginner. I was thinking about that, and and I, and I listened to Mike Troutman, and I was like, he took what I was going to say. Oh no! Well, no, but it's but it's it's the right advice. And I do you remember? Do you remember uh, Charles Nelson Riley? Do you remember him? Oh yeah. So there's a great documentary. It's a it's a it's a filming of his last thing that he did before he passed, which he did this stage show called The Life of Riley. And in it, he he talked about studying your craft, like really, really studying your craft. Uh, and he was saying he grew up in a time where you were never going to get on stage. You were never going to get acting work. You were never, unless you were a studied person. And, mm. and I've seen a trend and probably you have it too. I went through an apprenticeship and I took on in, in my life, I've had, I've had four apprentices of my own and two of my, my oldest sons, both are professional entertainers, jugglers. And, and so I've, I really believe in the idea of that passing on, but also simultaneously, I've seen people that go, oh, I can buy these magic tricks that come fully assembled. And all I have to do is just follow the instructions and I don't have to learn the craft or I, I learned to juggle three balls, but I don't have to be that good at it. And my advice is this is to train as much as possible and to, to work as hard as you can towards mastering your skill. We all get to a point. I think mm -hmm. all of us in the beginning get to a point where we are good enough to get ourselves on stage because that's the goal, right? We want to get good enough that we can get hired, that we can, we can do shows. And we all hope that we look backwards and go, man, I really improved. Right. I, I really, I really got better. And there are always people that you run into where you go like getting the work was the goal, not getting, not mastering the art. So I'm always encouraging everybody, uh, especially young people to go, like, if you want to be a juggler, that's great. Learn to dance. Go take a mime class. Take an acting class. Take an improvisation class. Study with your peers. Don't, you know, really try to make sure they're professional quality classes with, with great instructors and dare to fail miserably at those things because I always view that every time you, you're trying to get better at something, you know, you're going to fail a bunch in the middle. You'll eventually work through the pain, work through the difficulty, and you'll find out that it's worth it. So I incorporate all of those things in my, in my show. Everything, everything. That's great advice for the beginner and the working pro. Keep, keep on working. Exactly. Keep on working. Keep on working at your craft. Dare yourself to break your own boundaries. Because I just think, and you're right, I think whether you're, you're an up-and-comer or you're, or you're an old dog, that if you're not challenging yourself to come up with new ideas and new motivations to be on stage. My, one of my greatest teachers, Tony Montanaro, would say that you may have done it a thousand times, but the audience may be seeing it for the first time. That's right. And if, and if you're presenting it as if it's the, the one thousandth time, they're going to know that. They're going to feel that. It's a new experience at that moment. So when I think of that woman that I did it with her in 30 years ago, and then I did it with her daughter, she was like, man, it was just as funny. It was just as great. So. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to Becky Goodyear um, mm. a while back, I don't know, seven or eight uh, interviews ago. Yep. And we were talking about uh, fairs and festivals and mm -hmm. how people save up money all year long to go to that fair or the festival, see us perform. And maybe like you said, we've done it a thousand times, yeah. but for them, it's the first time it's they've the first seen time. it. Yeah. And we need to respect that and, you know, give them the best show that we possibly can. Absolutely. I, I've seen performers that they've, they've forgotten the motivation of why they did the, a particular act in the first place. And it's just down to what are the applause points, you know? Yeah. And I, I still love seeing people that go, I remember the original, the, the original concept of why I wrote this routine and I stick with it and I present it as brand new every time. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing when you see people do it. All right. Well, give us one book recommendation, one or two, and uh, tell us why. All right. I got two. Obviously, I've talked a lot about him. Tony Montanaro has an amazing book. Tony has passed away, but Tony's, his work lives on. And uh, he has an amazing book called Mime Spoken Here. He calls it a, a, a portable workshop because Tony was such a believer. And this is what I loved about what he really got through to so many of us is he'd say, Anyone can learn to juggle. Anyone can learn to dance. Anyone can learn to sing. Anyone can learn to balance things. Anyone can learn to do those things. What's going to make the difference is, is what you, the individual, bring to the work. So what's going to make you stand out is your personality, your intentions, your sense of humor, your 
own personal grace or your ability to, to fall flat on your face and get up, your improv ability. What is it that Mike Miklon does better than anyone else? And that doesn't necessarily mean I'm a better juggler, but what is the performance piece? What, did, what do I bring? And his book really helps you find that. It talks a lot about physical eloquence and, and how to present, but it really does lead you into this, this concept of understanding that you, the individual, you are the spark. You are the difference. Now, you mentioned two books? Yeah, there's another book um, written by Davis Robinson. It's called The Physical Comedy Handbook. And he was a student of Tony's. He, was, he still is part of the Bojest uh, Theater Company, and he is the theater professor at Bowdoin College in Maine. And he is one of the most, he, he's, he's a phenomenal teacher anyway, but the book is fantastic in, again, getting people to understand the essence of, of physical comedy. Speci it's really specific to that. And it's a great, great book. All right. I'm going to do the best I can to, to, to research that. And I'll put both of those on my um, website. You know, you're ta you've talked to Mike Troutman, you're talking to Lee Faulkner, you're talking to yep. me. There's a lot of us that we got a lot of this similar training where it was like, you know, it's in, Tony would call it inside out work where you got to get, you got to figure out the inside. Then you get, then you start changing the outside. And, and a lot of us have that. You're fantastic, Mike. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mike, for doing my podcast. Where can they get a hold of you? I would say the best way to get a hold of me right now is through Johnson Hall. So you can just either call, email me at mike at johnsonhall.org or mike at boodogfilms.com. Uh, and thanks to all my variety artists who found this podcast valuable. Tell a friend. That's how we can spread the word. And don't forget to go to my website to get your free copywriting checklist at thevarietyartist.com. Also, make sure to get your free audiobook from audible.com. Just go to thevarietyartist.com slash book to get your first book for free. You can reach me at uh, my email address at john at the variety artist.com or join my Facebook at the variety artist, where you can ask me to ask questions of our guests. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist, but your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist, but until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.